you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And Lord, we can speak boldly (laughs) when things are easy. But Lord, give us courage when things aren't. And give us wisdom so we don't get things wrong and overstep as well. Lord, we want to, we want to be your witnesses in this world. We want, to, we want to get that right. We want to be bold like Peter, James, and John. And Lord, as we get into your word this morning, we just pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to hear from you because we are your people and we want to live as your people. Uh, Lord, be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, it's not working. All right. So we're we're still in Hebrews this morning. For the last few weeks, actually most of this year, we've been doing a series on Hebrews. And we did a bit of a detour through through looking at how uh, the devil works in this world. But it wasn't really a detour because we were looking and seeking to explain. There we go. We were looking and seeking to explain how uh, evil works in this world and how the devil has power over death. But over the last couple of weeks, what we've looked at is we've looked at how the Bible warns backsliders and also encourages us to strive to enter into God's rest. And I encourage you to, if you haven't heard those two sermons, listen to them together because they're really two parts of one important message, which is that we have to strive to, to protect our faith in Christ. I mean, what does resting in Christ look like? It means fighting against sin, fighting against temptation, And following God's laws and commands in scriptures, why? Because they are good for us. God's commands are good for us. And this is really important to understand. The Old Testament law was actually good for the Israelites. It was actually designed to protect the Israelites from all sorts of pagan cultic rituals, which caused many peoples to live in absolute depravity and slavery and debauchery and destroyed them completely. The law was designed to protect people from debt, from poverty, from being abandoned by society. It was designed to protect the Israelites from losing their nationality to mass immigration because it had rules on how people become an Israelite. To protect the ordinary people from being fooled by the elites, which was really important because the Israelite law was written down for all to read and all were supposed to be able to teach, taught to read it so that the elites couldn't keep it from them and fool them into what actually was you know, by, by secret rituals. It was also designed to protect them from disease, from bad diets, from drunkenness, and all sorts of other things. And while we are not under the Old Testament law, there is still a lot of it which does apply to us and which we can learn from. And one day I'm actually going to do a few sermons, maybe one day soon, a few sermons on what the Old Testament teaches about debt and finances, just simply because it is so much wiser than the ways of our culture today. I mean, the ways of our culture today are destroying people's lives and families. So if the Old Testament law was good for people, how much better is the superior covenant in Jesus? It is definitely not legalistic to teach people, encourage people to strictly follow the commands of Christ because these commands are good for us. They are the best things for us. And it's foolish to ignore them. But sadly, at different points, we all ignore them. And I want you to think of the best man or the best woman you know. Just think of it in your mind. Who is the best man or the best woman that you know? Now, in their own righteousness, that person stands condemned before God. This is true of all of us. Not everyone is equally sinful, but everyone is sinful and falls short of the glory of God. And this is why we needed more than just a lawgiver and a good law. We actually needed somebody who could fulfill the law on our behalf because we are fallen. I mean, the law is good for us, but it also, even though it is good for us, what does it also do? It highlights our transgressions, our sins. Why? Because we all sin. And just because we know something is good for us doesn't mean we do it, does it? Does it? Do we always do what's good for us? No. In fact, people often openly do stuff which is bad for them. Openly, brazenly, and knowingly. Correct? Often. 
Because the human heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. And we need a high priest to speak on our behalf who can advocate for us, who is like us, but better than us. And we needed Jesus to do that for us. So let's look at what the, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews tells us about our incredible high priest. And the first thing we see is that he is the best priest. Now, what is a priest? What is a priest? A priest is someone who represents mankind on behalf of God and intercedes on behalf of those people before God. And that is what a priest is, but no man is enough to do this. We need someone better than men. And Hebrews begins by reminding us of our need for someone just like Jesus. Sorry, this just keeps moving and it keeps distracting me. I'm going to put that at the bottom. Hebrews 4.14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now, with all that we've learned so far, why do you think the writer of Hebrews is talking about how much better a high priest Jesus is? Why is that? Well, because the rabbinical Jews would have been arguing with the Jewish people, or the Jewish Christians who had believed in Jesus, and saying, come on, guys, come on. How can you know that your sins are forgiven? I mean, we've got the temple. We've got the high priest and the holy of holies and the guy who can go in to the holy of holies. How do you know that your sins are actually dealt with when we've got a guy who can actually go in there and do what the law said. And they would have had a bit of a superiority complex about this because they controlled access to the Mosaic rituals through access to the temple. And these Jewish converts to Christianity would have been incredibly tempted to go back to these old covenant ways and back to it because it was such a visible and powerful representation of salvation in God. Indeed, this is likely why God destroyed the temple absolutely and completely in AD 70. Because with a big exclamation mark, what was he saying? The old ways are done. We're in the new covenant now. It's finished. And what's fascinating is what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 14 about our incredible high priest. Look what he says. A great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now this is fascinating. You can look at this from many different directions, but I think one, this is incredibly fascinating if you look at it in, in light of what it says about the Tower of Babel. It says in Genesis chapter 11, it says, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. What were they trying to do at the Tower of Babel? Reach into the highest heavens where God was, right? And this is what mankind has always wanted to do. Mankind has always wanted to reach God and, and find their own way to God. And what's fascinating here is, in other words, this Christian writer is pointing out that our high priest is capable of what no other man is capable of, of reaching the highest heavens where God dwells. And if you're wondering why the Tower of Babel looks a lot like the European Union Parliament, it's not a coincidence. But if you want to talk more about that, that's Bible study on Tuesday nights. There you go, that's my plug for Bible study. I always forget to do it at the beginning of the service, so I put something in the middle so I would remember this time. What's fascinating is if we read this comment, he passed through the heavens, in light of Genesis 11 we see that the writer of Hebrews is actually mocking the Jews who believe in the temple for their salvation and in mortal priests. See, their high priest is just a man. Our high priest is like the Lord who came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And how does he do this? By passing through the heavens at will, whenever he wants and effectively, what this is saying is, your guys are like the guys who built the tower. Our priest is, like, is the Lord who rebuked those guys. Now, who do you want advocating for you? Who do you want advocating for you before God? Do you want a man like us? 
who's fallen? Or do you want a God-man who is capable of going from heaven down to earth and back again completely at will? Our high priest came down and defeated the devil and returned to his throne. And I love how Jimmy Bratcher puts this. There is a throne up in the sky. There sits a king clothed in white. The scepter he holds in his hand. This one he reigns. The God become man. In this perfect place, he's the light. In all of heaven, he's the light. He is perfect in every way. Still bears the skies he bore that day. Now, if you're wondering why I did that, it's because I love that song so much that if I had have tried to read those lyrics to you, I would have started singing them. And so, out of my care for you, I got Jimmy Bratcher to do it himself. <laughs> but don't you just love those lyrics? I mean, how awesome is it that we have a king, a high priest in heaven whose body is scarred? A high priest better than any other high priest. And let us hold confession to our faith in Jesus because he is the best one who can make the case on our behalf. And for all of us who believe in him, he is making that case on our behalf before the throne of God the Father. And the awesome thing about it is he's also a sympathetic priest. You know, one of the most important aspects of priesthood is being able to sympathize with the frailties and the fallenness of humankind and of those you represent. But how can a divine being do this? Because the divinity is so far above us. But the one who reigns is the God become man. And this is why he can sympathize with us so powerfully. Hebrews 4 verse 15 to 16 for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, our high priest is one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now that's fascinating to read that because that almost sounds like blasphemy, doesn't it? It almost sounds like blasphemy to say that the Son of God can be tempted by sin. And I have no doubt that many Jews in the first century actually really struggled with this concept because they believed that God was so far and above humankind. And he is far and above humankind. But in Jesus, God and man come together. And that is incredible. And, you know, the divinity of Jesus is part of the reason why so many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees really struggled to believe that he was who, who he was, that he was who he said he was. They really struggled with this because of their concept of God being so other. But it was in their scriptures all along. Daniel 7, verse 13 to 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. You know, to, to ride, the only one who could ride on the clouds of heaven in the ancient Near East, this, this imagery, was God. 
That was an imagery of divine. So in other words, Daniel 7 says, along comes the God-man and stands before the Ancient of Days. It was in their scriptures all along. The Messiah was always meant to be the God-man. And he really did face temptation like a man, yet without sin. Without sin. And this is really important. It is not sinful to be tempted. It is sinful to give in to that temptation and let it become desire, because from that desire brings forth sin and then death. And Jesus didn't do this. He instantly shut down temptation. You remember how he responded to the devil when the devil tried to, shut, uh, tried to tempt him? He shut him down with Scripture every time, instantly. And, and I, I think we often just gloss over this fact that God became a man. Like We, we, we just gloss over that. But it is so incredible. I mean, Many people still struggle to, with this concept today, but we just gloss over it so quickly. But he did this, and he did this. Why? On our behalf. And because God became a man, a real man, he can sympathize with us because he has experienced life and suffered through life just like we have. I mean, think about this, right? Think about this. Jesus faced poverty or lack. Matthew 8, 19, and lack, I should say, 19 to 20. And the scribe came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow wherever you go. And, and Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Isn't that fascinating? You know, God as man on the earth, you know, if this was Hinduism or um, Islam or some other religion, you know what he would have done? He would have had a big palace on top of a mountain and made people come to him, right? But what did our God do? As a man on earth, he, he had nowhere to stay for a big chunk of his ministry. And in fact, he also knew what it meant to need to be provided for by others. Luke 8, 1 to 3. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Isn't that interesting? You know, I don't know if you've ever experienced poverty or homelessness or going without, but I actually have uh, for a period of my life, self-inflicted. <laughs> but it was horrible. And if you've ever experienced it, or even just the... the, the, the the threat of losing what you have, you know how horrible it is. It is a painful experience. And Jesus experienced it. Isn't that incredible? He also faced betrayal. One of Jesus' closest friends betrayed him. Luke 22, 47 to 48. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd. And the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew, near, he drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, we all know that in some cultures, they greet with kisses. It was very awkward being in France and finding that out. <laughs> but I guess you can say it's the only church I've ever been to where they obey that command in 1 Corinthians 16 to greet each other with a holy kiss, literally. That's what they did. <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't just a greeting. Sometimes in some cultures it was actually more than that. It was a symbol of intimate friendship and closeness and, and being, being of loyalty. And Judas was close to Jesus, right up there with the other apostles. And he chose an intimate sign of friendship to seal his betrayal. David talks about this, having experienced the same thing. Psalm 55, verse 12 to 13, For it is not an enemy who taunts me, and then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. Can you relate to this? Have you ever been betrayed? I have. And it hurts. And it's happened in so many little ways and big ways at different points in my life, I just expect it to happen again sometime. Not because I'm black-pilled, not at all, but just because I understand human nature. And Jesus was betrayed, and he expected to be betrayed, and he knew the pain 
of betrayal. I mean, listen to those words. Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? You can just feel the pain in those words, especially reading them in light of Psalm 55 and what David went through. But Jesus also faced being abandoned. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat down in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place uh, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples fled him, left him and fled. Man, that would have hurt. Especially because what was Jesus doing just before this? Praying so intensely that he sweated blood. He knew what was coming. He knew what he was about to face. And he was laying down his life on behalf of these men and the rest of us. And as soon as the hour of fear, of, of, of pressure came, what happened? Come? What happened? They fled. <laughs> they just took off. This would have hurt Jesus especially knowing what he was about to go through. And if you stand for the truth, if you've ever had to stand for the truth, whether it's at home or at work or at school or in different places like that, you've probably experienced being left standing alone. You've probably experienced that. And, you know, on on a different level, some people have been abandoned by a spouse, by their husband or wife, either literally or even just emotionally. They checked out a long time ago. Some have been abandoned by a friend or a parent or someone else really close. Jesus experienced this. Jesus experienced what it was like to be abandoned, yet without sin. He understood it, but without sin. He experienced pressure, deep emotional pressure, the fickleness of crowds, being tired, and so many other things that human beings experience that he experienced. Hence, when we are told we have a sympathetic high priest, we really do have a sympathetic high priest. He gets what, he gets what it is like to be a human being because he's the God-man. The big difference was, though, without sin. And because of this, he's better than those other priests. And this is important for um, this is an important message for our culture to hear, especially in Australia, because for obvious reasons in Australia, priests have a pretty bad reputation. But he is better than those other priests. Hebrews five verse one to four: For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So he's talking about human priests here. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obliged to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of of the people. And no one takes honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So here the writers flip to talking about fallen human priests. And Aaron was the best, probably one of the best of the Hebrews outside of Moses and Joshua. In fact, he was, he was chosen by God to be the high priest. He was Moses' right-hand man, and yet even he needed to be rebuked. Remember him, with him and Miriam when they opposed Moses. And he had to make sacrifices for his own sins because he was fallen. And he was one of the good ones. He was one of the good ones. You know, a priest role has always been to be a righteous standard bearer amongst the people of God to represent people before God and on behalf of those people. And to do this, they have to have an understanding of human weakness and show mercy to the weak. And a true priest like Aaron is selected according to God's standards, not man's standards. And that's how Aaron was chosen and his descendants. Now I want you to consider what a priest's role is. Consider that. And consider how badly many priests have acted. Pretty badly. I remember when I was doing an assignment on research uh, into the Royal Commission Institutional Child Abuse, that those who had been abused by their priests and ministers uh, felt it was like a, a, a double betrayal. 
They felt betrayed both physically and spiritually. Because they were. A priest has a powerful role in someone's life because those who believe in their sinfulness before God, what do we do? We recognize our need for someone to advocate on our behalf. And for such an advocate to use that kind of power and abuse it to gain access to people and do horrible things to them, there is no punishment too severe for such a person. And that is how, how thoroughly we know priests and, and other leaders and churches have failed in this nation. Not just them, others as well, but we, we're talking specifically about this this morning. But even at a lesser scale, I mean, that's the most severe case of the, of the wickedness that man can fall to. But even at a lesser scale, just in general, no man is capable of effectively advocating before God because no man is righteous. All are fallen. In fact, no man is supposed to take that role on our behalf. Why? Because the entire church are priests. And we have a high priest in heaven who is advocating on our behalf and who represents us before God who is effective. And he is absolutely effective. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, that I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. See, no human priest is capable of doing what Christ is capable of doing. And yet, Jesus did not just do this of his own accord. Remember? Remember? What did he do? He said, I, he set himself to do only that which his father had told him to do. It was him and his father's initiative working together. He and his father worked together on this plan. God determined that Jesus would be the priest that we need. And while he was on earth, he prayed prayers, and his prayers were heard. Look at this. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Why was he heard? Because of his reverence. Now James says something very interesting about this. He says in James chapter 5 that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And being without sin and filled with perfect reverence, Jesus' prayers were absolutely effective in a way ours can't be. And this is important to understand because Psalm, the Psalms tell us if we cherish sin in our hearts, the Lord would not hear our prayers. But there is no sin in Jesus' heart. And so, who do you want praying for you more than anyone else before God? Jesus. It's good to pray, and it's good for us to pray for each other, but don't you want someone who prays perfectly, <laughs> without fault? And it was without fault. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Even though he is God, Jesus learned what it meant to be a man in the flesh, required to live under the commands of his Father. Isn't that interesting? That is fascinating. And he completed this role perfectly, not like Adam who failed at the first opportunity. And because he did this, he is now in the highest possible priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. Now, what that means, I'm going to leave for another sermon. But the implications of it are really important. And this is why we need to focus on Jesus, because he's the only one who can effectively get our back. And so to summarize everything that we've looked at here, he is the high priest who is chosen by God and not self-promoted. He is higher in rank than any other priest. He knows how to pray perfectly on our behalf and how to seek God on our behalf. And he understands the words of the commands of God from both directions, both as lawgiver and law fulfiller. And he fulfilled those commands in a way that we can't. Therefore, he is the author or source of our eternal salvation for all who believe in him. 
Who else are you going to go to for salvation? I mean, if you're here this morning and you're not yet a believer, who else are you going to go to? The Jews were hoping in their temple. And what happened to their temple? It got destroyed. And you know who actually destroyed it? Them. Not the Romans. I mean, the Romans helped after a while, but you know what happened? There was a fight between different groups of radical Jews in the temple, and during that fight, a fire broke out, and it burnt the temple down. And because there was a siege happening, they, they couldn't get water, to, to, and it burned to the ground. In other words, they destroyed their own hope, which was no hope at all, because once God had left the temple, what was it? Just another building. Just another building with walls and bricks. But hope in Jesus, this is eternally secure, and it is the only thing which can save us. It is the only hope we have which is secure. So let me ask you a really simple question. Are you going to reject Jesus and the salvation that can be found in him? Or are you going to trust in the only one who can save you? Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Without exception, the question is, will you do it willingly or not? Will you have Jesus standing before the the throne, saying to his Father, Lord, this is one of mine? Or will he say to you, depart from me, you evildoer, I never knew you. You will confess he is Lord, but only if you do it in this life and trust in him will you be saved. You know, many of Jesus' own race in his day and today did not believe in him as Lord and Savior. Thankfully, some did believe, including Pharisees like Paul. Will you be accounted among those who rejected him? And share the fate of the temple? Or will you be accounted amongst those who believe in our incredible high priest and get welcomed into his family for eternity? I leave that with you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your truth. We just pray that you would be with us this morning as we continue to worship you. And Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here this morning who has even a shadow of doubt in their hearts about their salvation, that they would trust in you and turn to believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen.